To get started, I'd like for each of you to look to the person to your left. Now look to the person to your right. One of the three of you has a dormant brain parasite. You probably got it from eating your favorite rare steak Friday night, eating that tomato right off the vine, or changing Fluffy's litter box. So what is this parasite that one third of the population has? It's called Toxoplasma gondii, and it's a parasite that lives inside of your cells, causing a disease known as toxoplasmosis. Now, if you've ever been around someone who is pregnant, or if you've ever been pregnant, you might remember that pregnant women are not supposed to clean cat litter boxes. This is because pregnant women are extra susceptible to passing this infection, toxoplasmosis, onto their unborn children. When you're infected with this parasite, usually from eating contaminated food, uh, the parasite is put into your stomach, which is just the right ingredient, stomach acid, to break up the cyst wall and allow each of the little parasites inside to invade the intestinal wall. From there, they move into your bloodstream and try to infect the rest of your body cells. Now, if you have a robust immune system, which most of us do, the infection will actually be cleared pretty quickly, and, uh, except in the muscle and brain tissues, because those are immune-privileged sites. Uh, if you have an immunocompromising disease, though, like cancer or AIDS, you can experience much more severe side effects of this disease, such as inflammation of the brain and the retina in your eye, and eventually it may lead to death. So if there's no vaccine or cure for this parasite, why would anybody volunteer to work with it? Well, volunteer is a pretty strong word. But when I was a sophomore here in college, I met with my advisor to decide when I should apply to medical school. I thought that medicine was the career for me, end of story. But this advisor was a pretty convincing person, and he thought I would regret not having engaged in any undergraduate research while I was here on campus. So I agreed to give it a short trial in his laboratory. Long story short, I stand before you three years later. And for me, it started when I was four. I would stumble and fall. I would stumble and fall. And one day, I decided to test a hypothesis. The hypothesis was that fuzz from my socks was impairing my ability to walk. So I sat down, and I picked the fuzz out, piece by piece. And I stood up, and I stumbled again. So although my hypothesis was proven false, my intense curiosity and need to answer questions remained. And by the time I got to college, I knew I wanted to be in research. I chose to work on toxoplasma because of an almost necessity to understand how a single-celled organism could control the complexities of the human brain. And I'll take with me the skills I learned here and apply them towards my doctorate at UNMC and a new partnership with the United States Army Medical Institute of Infectious Diseases. So despite coming to research from different paths, Maggie and I arrived in the same laboratory with the same passion for understanding this disease, toxoplasmosis. And with good reason, as it turns out, there are a lot of people who are exposed to toxoplasma every year. So do me a favor, if you have ever drank any water at all, raise your hand. <laughs> Should be everyone, if not, please consult your personal physicians. <laughs> <laughs> now, raise your hand for me if you boil every single drop of it that you drink, that you use to brush your teeth, or that you shower in? No one, okay, well. If people here in the United States are sometimes, albeit infrequently, infected through water outbreaks of this parasite. So what happens is snow melt in the mountains and heavy rainfalls can overfill our rivers and lakes. Now this includes the resources that we use as our drinking water, which are filtered through treatment centers. Well, sometimes when there's too much water, treatment centers actually have to let the water go without being filtered. Instead, they use a process called hyperchlorination. Now this is perfectly valid in most cases, but toxoplasma is special it can actually survive hyperchlorination. So in the northern United States a few years ago, we actually had an outbreak of toxoplasma. Young children, pregnant women who hadn't touched a cat, and others were coming into their doctor's office and testing positive for toxoplasma. Now this is pretty rare, and the cause was ambiguous for a while, but as it turns out, um, the city was having to hyperchlorinate their water for a few weeks prior to this outbreak because of a, a massive snow melt in the mountains. And the toxoplasma was actually getting into the water through an infected mountain lion population several miles away who also used that stream as their water source. Now, felines like mountain lions are not the only animal population affected by this parasite. Sea coral and oysters can harbor the parasitic eggs, meaning when their predator, the otter, consumes them, they also get the infection. This has led to multiple die-offs of marine species over the years. 
So you could say that toxoplasma is a little like the McDonald's of pathogens. It's everywhere. <laughs> From cockroaches to sea cows to you and to me, toxoplasma is capable of infecting a very wide range of hosts. But it actually has a favorite host, Fluffy. Your feline household companion is the place that toxoplasma most likes to be. It's more, it becomes more virulent through sexual reproduction there and is more able to infect other hosts. But why does toxoplasma bother with all of these different hosts if it really just wants to be in your cat? I think this comes back to an interesting study done by the University of California at Berkeley. They took healthy mice and toxoplasma positive mice and exposed them to bobcat urine, a natural predator scent. Now the healthy mice did exactly as you would expect. They shied away from their potential mortal doom. But the toxoplasma positive mice did the exact opposite. They actually sought out their natural predator scent, putting themselves in harm's way. Now the fear response is one of the most innate traits we have. We share it with mice, with dinosaurs, with sharks. And Toxoplasma has figured out a way to rewire a mouse's brain to meet its ends. So how does this type of parasitic mind control relate to us human beings? Well, in humans, our risk-taking response is actually what takes the place of the fear response in mice. So instead of, lo instead of losing our fear of cats, we lose our inhibitions. Um, infected people are more likely to be involved in car accidents to engage in risk-taking behaviors. Infected females are more likely to act promiscuously, while infected males are more likely to behave aggressively and to and cheat on their partners. But angry men and promiscuous women are rarely eaten by cats. So why does toxoplasma do this? This, I think, trickles back to transmission and how toxoplasma has become the incredibly diverse parasite that it is. Historically and evolutionarily, the more promiscuous females and more aggressive males got more mates meaning they could have more offspring. So whether you're a human or an earthworm, toxoplasma will hijack this function to further its world domination. Studies have actually shown that toxoplasma can survive and be potentially transmitted during sex, making it a sexually transmitted disease. That's now four ways you can get this pathogen, orally, blood, mother to baby, and sexually. But this isn't just a one-way street. As much as toxoplasma affects us when we're infected, we also affect them. Our immune system is one of the most dynamic and responsive forces in the world, pushing toxoplasma to the limits of its ability to adapt. In fact, it's been said that toxoplasma has become what it is simply because of our own immune systems. Speaking of the immune system, toxoplasma has some pretty cool ways to both evade and manipulate it. As the parasite multiplies in our bodies, it sheds pieces of itself that our immune cells can recognize as not being from us. It then begins the beautiful process of mass-producing cells capable of taking care of toxoplasma. However, for that one-third of us in here that's infected, toxoplasma realized we were onto it, and it began tucking itself away in our muscles and in our brains, as Maddie mentioned earlier. Now, the muscle cysts can often be reached and eradicated, but the brain is an immune-privileged site. And that means that our immune cells have trouble getting there. So if we could harness the immune system's capabilities to take care of this infection before it ever got to the brain, we could decrease the worldwide burden quite rapidly. We could vaccinate livestock so we can prevent infection in our food sources. We could vaccinate women who want to become pregnant before they do to ameliorate their chances of miscarriage and birth defects associated with this pathogen. And we could, of course, vaccinate your household cat, Fluffy, to prevent infection in your home. But what about the one-third of us who are already infected? If a vaccine were to be developed today, it would still take a generation or two to really reduce the number of people who have this disease. And if I have an active to a toxoplasma infection right now, I will still have it when I'm 80 years old, vaccinated or not. So what we need to do is to develop drugs that are capable of clearing the brain and muscle cysts from our bodies so that they don't have a chance to come back when you're older and fighting more uh, diseases that could compromise your immune system. But this isn't as easy as it sounds. Toxoplasma in humans are actually very genetically similar. This means that things we can effectively target in the parasite are often accidentally targeted in humans. Take, for example, Daraprim introduced into the media earlier this year by a lovely fellow by the name of Martin Screlly when he raised the price of this life-saving drug 5,000%. This is actually the only FDA-approved drug for treating toxoplasma in the United States. But Daraprim 
is not the miracle drug it might sound like. It actually has very serious side effects that includes killing your blood cells, congenital birth defects, and the potential for death. Now, this doesn't sound great to me. On top of all of that, it actually doesn't stop the infection. It just stops it from killing your, blood, er, from killing your cells. So, the best option at this juncture is to develop new drugs that have the ability to target the parasite specifically. And one great thing about the immune system is that it was expertly engineered to take care of pathogens just like toxoplasma. In fact, the way I would confirm that one third of us have it is by checking if our bodies have specifically responded by generating antibodies. Now, antibodies are going to have a particular specificity to a pathogen, and they'll alert the system that there's a problem. So if we could take parts of a pathogen and show it to the immune system before you encounter the full parasite, you could generate that same protective immune response without contracting the infection. That's how a lot of vaccines work. So in toxoplasma, we're taking chunks of it along with immune-stimulating agents to draw a stronger, more robust response. That way, if you eat steak tartare, a raw beef dish chocked full of toxoplasma, your body will be able to register and kill the invaders before they have a chance to form those lifelong cysts. But if you've already tried the steak tartare, you may be wondering, what about me? Well, in the laboratory today, we are working on hundreds of compounds that have the ability to target the parasite and not the host. This means that we should not anticipate the side effects that are commonly seen with antiparasitics that are available today, such as Daraprim. Additionally, researchers who work on this sort of project are paying special attention to the compound's ability to get into the brain to clear the cysts present there so that they don't have a chance to come back when our immune system is not as well developed. So this means that in the future, Daraprim may not be your only hope. So if we've startled you with all this talk about brain parasites, rest assured, people are working across the world to both treat and understand toxoplasma, including here in Nebraska. Now, despite all we've told you today, for a long time, toxoplasma was thought to be a harmless organism, just existing in our brains, like a lot of our other resident organisms. And it wasn't until the last 80 years that we understood the negative effects, mostly because of uh, research going on in infectious disease at the time, just like what's going on here at UNO every day. Even more surprising is those behavioral effects were not discovered until our lifetime. So many of you out there might be wondering why we don't have a vaccine or a cure. Many of you might recall the Ebola outbreak of 2014, the Zika outbreak of 2015. These have the same question with the same answer. We have lived with these pathogens for a long time, and it wasn't until they reached an outbreak status that we needed to push back. Research is driven by funding and by demand. If we don't know something is a potential threat, we might not contribute to it until it's in the forefront of the media's eye, like with Ebola and with Zika. And research in the field of infectious disease is far from over. So without your support and awareness, we would not know what to focus on or make progress. This single-celled organism has likely gained the ability to change our personalities, to induce biochemical changes that alter our behaviors. Now, you've all heard of the crazy cat lady, right? She's the one who takes an uncomfortable number of photographs of her and her cat. <laughs> now, some evidence would suggest that this person is likely infected. People who are infected with toxoplasma are more likely to find the sm smell of cat urine to be pleasant and also are more likely to be friendly towards cats. So, being obsessed with cats, especially this one, might seem like a lighthearted consequence of infection. But this parasite has also been linked to very serious mental disorders such as schizophrenia and depression. So what's controlling you may not be that eight pounds of brain matter in your cranium, but the body's resident organisms. There could be an entire network fighting for control of your brains that we have yet to discover. Now, our bodies are covered with and helped by these bacteria in most cases. In fact, without some of the species in your intestines, you would not be able to digest your food appropriately. But some of them might turn out to be a little more malicious than we thought, much like toxoplasma. Each individual person actually carries their own particular blend of species. So there are thousands of species of bacteria on our skin and in our tissues that we have yet to characterize. So we may not know who exactly is in control of you. 
But this is not a PSA on getting rid of these organisms. Far from it. Without some of them, we would not be able to survive. So instead of selling your cat on Craigslist <laughs> or buying an isolation bubble, consider reading about some of... <laughs> we made that for this. Um, <laughs> So instead of doing that, consider reading about some of the other amazing work happening here in Nebraska and worldwide. Information is our greatest protection against these potential internal threats. And the story is not complete until we know what we're getting from these organisms and what they're getting from us. Thank, Thank you. you.